Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Nuclear Criticality Safety Lecture Series. Today we're going to provide a brief introduction to the field of nuclear reactor kinetics. Reactor kinetics and reactor dynamics seek to understand how a reactor responds to time-dependent situations. Typically we're modeling the reactor's response to some sort of reactivity insertion, such as a change in moderator temperature and density. In criticality safety, this reactivity insertion is usually caused by an upset condition, such as a loss of mass control, or volume control, or moderation control. This system's reactivity, rho, describes how far a reactor is above or below being critical, and rho equals k effective minus 1 divided by k effective. We'll circle back and talk about reactivity more in a few minutes. So how does a reactor respond to a reactivity insertion? Well, let's start out with a very, very simple model that actually assumes incorrect physics. This model assumes that the power P of a reactor is equal to its initial power, P0, times K effective to the power of T over lambda. This lambda term is known as the prompt neutron generation time, which is simply the average amount of time that it takes for one fission neutron to generate another fission neutron in our system. Lambda is about equal to 10 to the minus 4 for thermal systems, and 10 to the minus 6 for fast systems, where things, of course, move faster. Because lambda is the amount of time it takes for one neutron to produce another neutron, the t divided by a lambda term in our equation above is simply the number of times that a neutron gets to have another step in its chain and to produce another daughter neutron. If k effective is greater than 1, then each step in that train reaction will, on average, generate more neutrons and increase the power of the system. So let's say that we have a small 20 cent reactivity insertion into our system. We'll discuss what dollars and cents mean later, but for now, we can assume that this is a relatively minor reactivity insertion. This reactivity insertion causes our reactor's power to increase because the system is now supercritical, and let's say that our reactor operator wants to keep things critical and that they respond as fast as they can by inserting the control rods. The average human reaction time is about 0.25 seconds, and the fastest human reaction time ever recorded is 0.101 seconds. Let's say that our operator manages a superhuman feat and beats this record, reacting to scram the reactor in 0.1 seconds after the transient begins. In that amount of time, the reactor power will increase by 172% for a thermal reactor, and it will have increased by a factor of 2.557 times 10 to the 43 for a fast reactor. Clearly this model is not realistic. We operate thermal reactors all the time without producing such huge, unstable, reactor-damaging power swings, and we've operated fast reactors without blowing up the universe. So why is our naive model incorrect? Our model is wrong for two reasons, delayed neutrons and feedback. Let's talk about delayed neutrons. Most of the neutrons in a reactor are emitted promptly, which means that they're emitted about 10 to the minus 14 seconds after a fission event occurs. But less than 1% of all fission neutrons are emitted with a delay somewhere between 0.1 and 1 second. These neutrons are known as delayed fission neutrons, and they're actually not emitted by fission despite their name. They're actually emitted by neutron-rich fission products that begin to undergo radioactive decay. Because these fission products have too many neutrons to be stable, sometimes they decay by emitting a neutron. The variable beta is known as the delayed neutron fraction, and like its name suggests, it represents the fraction of fission neutrons that are emitted with a delay from these radioactive fission products. Beta equals around 0.0065 for uranium-235, and about 0.0020 for plutonium-239. The delayed neutron fraction varies for different fissile isotopes, as shown here, but in general, increasing a fission target's atomic weight, A, will increase its delayed neutron fraction, since this isotope's fission products will be more neutron-rich and even farther from stability, whereas increasing the fission target's atomic number will actually decrease its delayed neutron fraction, since its fission products are more likely to be closer to stability and less neutron-rich. Similarly, the delayed neutron fraction tends to decrease as the energy of the neutron that induces fission increases. This is because faster neutrons are more likely to knock out more prompt fission neutrons when their target isotope fissions, 
which results in fission products that are less neutron rich and closer to stability. These delayed neutron fractions might not sound like much, but they're actually significant enough to allow us to control reactors. All reactors are actually operated so that they're subcritical if you only consider prompt neutrons. These reactors must have delayed neutrons to maintain their chain reactions and to stay critical. This means that increases in the reactor's power are constrained by the time scale for which delayed neutrons are emitted, which is seconds to tenths of seconds, not nanoseconds. This table shows how the period of a multiplying system changes as a function of the eigenvalue both with or without delayed neutrons. This period is again the time it takes for the neutron's power to increase by a factor of e. We see that delayed neutrons dramatically slow down a system's power increase to the point where we can actually control nuclear reactors fairly easy during supercritical transients. In general, this equation describes a reactor's time-dependent response to a reactivity insertion. This equation contains two terms the first of which describes the multiplication of delayed neutrons, and the second of which describes the multiplication of prompt neutrons. If we look at a plot of the reactor's time-dependent response to various reactivity insertions, we see that the reactor's power sees an initial, fast, almost step-like increase, which occurs because the prompt neutron population increases in the presence of a positive reactivity insertion. After this initial prompt jump, the reactor's power increases at a slower rate because the delayed neutron population holds it back and only gradually increases. Remember that these delayed neutrons are born on the timescale of 0.1 seconds to 1 second, so it takes much longer for their population to increase than it does for the prompt neutron population. We see a similar effect for negative reactivity insertions. Initially, the power drops quickly because the prompt neutron population rapidly decreases in the presence of a negative reactivity insertion, while the delayed neutron population decreases much more slowly and holds back how quickly the power can decrease. This gradual power decrease influences how we should respond to criticality accidents. There is a limit to how quickly we can shut down a reactor's power and its delayed neutron population, regardless of how much negative reactivity we insert. So even after a criticality accident ends and the fissile materials are moved into a very subcritical configuration, the fissile material present will still be producing power and will still be emitting delayed neutrons and will still provide a dose to anyone who sticks around and does not evacuate. This is why facilities have criticality alarms, which we'll discuss more in the next lecture. A criticality accident happens so blindingly fast that we can't stop it once it's started. And so the criticality alarms don't prevent criticality accidents, but they do mitigate the consequences of an accident by notifying workers of the need to evacuate and avoids increasing their dose because of delayed fission neutron production. As we can see in the plus 1% reactivity insertion, there is a threshold beyond which delayed neutrons can no longer hold back the rate of a reactor's power increase. The point where delayed neutrons no longer matter is known as prompt supercritical. At prompt supercritical, the system has enough reactivity to be supercritical using prompt neutrons alone. At this point, the reactor's power actually increases exponentially, just like it did during our earlier example in this lecture. So for a reactor to be supercritical using prompt neutrons alone, its reactivity must exceed beta. The unit of dollars is often used to describe a system's reactivity where one dollar of reactivity corresponds to one beta worth of reactivity, which is again enough reactivity to make the system go prompt supercritical. The term cents is also used to describe reactivity insertions, where one cent is just one one hundredth of a dollar. Like the units of barns and shakes, dollars and cents are historical units that were developed by Manhattan Project scientists so that they could discuss weapons physics in public venues without divulging classified information. Now, even though power reactors are designed so that it is relatively difficult to bring them into the prompt supercritical regime, it's fairly easy to gather a big enough lump of fissile material to cause it to be prompt supercritical. Because of this, nearly all criticality accidents involve prompt supercritical transients. Every blue flash that we talk about is actually a prompt supercritical transient.
These transients release a significant amount of energy and can cause enormous, often deadly, doses to any fissile material workers who are close to the accident. But still, they don't release 10 to the 43rd joules of energy, just like we saw in our bad math example. Why is this? Because feedback eventually shuts down the supercritical transient. Feedback refers to the set of phenomena that cause a reactor or a system to become less reactive as its power increases and as it heats up. Temperature reactivity coefficients, which are just derivatives for K effective with respect to a system's temperature, describe how these feedback mechanisms will lower the reactivity of our system. The mechanisms for feedback include Doppler broadening, where resonance absorption cross-sections become shorter and wider for materials as their temperature increases. These wider resonances tend to absorb more neutrons than skinny, narrow resonances, which means that Doppler broadening generally causes a loss of reactivity because of this, Doppler broadening generally causes temperature reactivity coefficients to be negative. Other feedback mechanisms include void feedback, where the heat released during a transient causes moderator to heat up and boil away. Losing moderator usually causes a negative reactivity insertion, but it's important to note that moderator reactivity coefficients are positive for over-moderated systems, which can lead to a runaway reaction. Thankfully, there have been no over-moderated runaway criticality accidents, but the Chernobyl accident saw this kind of runaway incident, where positive reactivity feedback from an over-moderated system caused the reactor's power to increase until a steam explosion blew apart the core. The Nordheim-Fuchs model describes the approximate behavior of a prompt supercritical transient. I derived the Nordheim-Fuchs model in my nuclear reactor kinetics lectures, but in this course, we'll mostly just look at what the model tells us about prompt supercritical transients. During these transients, the system's power will peak at some T max, after which the power decreases towards pre-transient levels. The reactor's power doesn't completely revert to its pre-transient levels because of delayed fission neutrons, which is again why we need to evacuate the area after a criticality accident occurs. If we plot the system's reactivity as a function of time, we'll see that the time at which this power peak, P max, occurs, corresponds to the point where feedback mechanisms cause the system's reactivity to drop below the reactivity threshold for a prompt supercritical transient. The Nordheim-Fuchs model shows us that the peak power for this transient is inversely proportional to lambda, which again is the prompt neutron generation time. Lambda is several orders of magnitude smaller for fast systems than for thermal systems, which means that prompt supercritical transients in fast systems produce much higher peak powers. On the other hand, the length of the transient, delta t, is directly proportional to lambda, which means that thermal systems have much longer prompt supercritical transients than fast systems. This delta t is approximately equal to 4 times lambda, which, even for thermal systems, is less than 1 millisecond. This means that there is no way at all for us to stop a prompt supercritical transient after it has started. We simply cannot respond fast enough to stop an accident once it has begun. Therefore, criticality safety must focus on preventing accidents and on mitigating the consequences of accidents after they have taken place. The energy released from a prompt supercritical transient, Q, is proportional to the dose received by any personnel around the system during the accident. Q is roughly equal to P max times delta T, and since delta T is proportional to lambda and P max is inversely proportional to lambda, this means that the energy release Q is mostly independent of lambda. So fast and thermal systems will both release around the same amount of energy during an accident. If we dig a little bit deeper, we'll find that Q is actually inversely proportional to the system's reactivity feedback coefficient, gamma E. Gamma sub E is generally smaller for fast systems than it is for thermal systems, which means that fast, prompt, supercritical transients will generally release more energy than thermal, prompt, supercritical transients. However, this assumes that the accident only causes one prompt supercritical excursion. Feedback will ultimately shut down the prompt supercritical transient, but supercritical configurations run the risk of having repeated supercritical transients after the system's fuel cools down and returns to its initial temperatures. 
Immediately after criticality accidents that involve fast, bare metal systems, fissile material workers tend to have usually disassembled the system, in the case of the Dagling accident in 1945 and the Sloten accident in 1946, or they tend to have removed any excess fuel elements, in the case of the Tomsk 1978 accident, or they tend to have taken some action to prevent repeated critical excursions. Disassembling the system tends to be more difficult for thermal spectrum accidents because these accidents tend to involve fissile solutions which might be pumped into a sealed container. In fact, the CEA's Crack 23 critical experiments intentionally pumped enough fissile material into a sealed cavity to cause repeated, prompt supercritical transients. After one transient ended, the moderator's voids began collapsing until another prompt supercritical transient began. Eventually this process stopped as the entire solution began heating up significantly, but not until many repeated supercritical excursions took place. Had a worker remained around the assembly for only the first excursion, then they would have received a significant, but survivable, dose. On the other hand, had they stayed for the entire duration of the transient, then they surely would have received a fatal dose. The Tokaimura criticality accident also saw repeated prompt supercritical excursions during a criticality accident involving a fissile solution. This accident took place at a JCO fuel conversion facility in the city of Tokaimura within the Ibarikin prefecture of Japan. This facility housed operations to recover and recycle UO2 scrap, as well as to convert UF6 and U308 into UO2. Some of these operations were large scale, but the criticality accident took place in one of these smaller scale operations. The facility generally operated with 5% enriched uranium, but this smaller scale operation was producing 18.8% enriched fuel for the Joyo Experimental Breeder Reactor. The operators working with this operation were relatively inexperienced, and one of the operators had only been on the job for a few months. Their operation involved dissolving uranium scrap into several small favorable geometry tanks, then transferring the solution into several favorable geometry columns, and then filling 4 liter bottles with the solution. However, this process was inconvenient. The drain for the favorable geometry columns was only 10 centimeters above the floor, which made it difficult to fill the 4 liter vessels. So instead, they chose to perform this process using a large, unfavorable geometry 100 liter precipitation tank. This tank had a stirring mechanism and made filling the 4 liter vessels much more convenient because of its greater height. Additionally, the operating manual was changed sometime between 1985 and 1987 to allow the workers to dissolve the scrap in a 10 liter bucket instead of in the dissolution vessel, which saved them about one hour of time and bypassed several dissolution and buffer tanks. After dissolving the scrap in the bucket, the operators were to transfer the solution using a 5 liter flask. Both of these convenient changes were in violation of the site's license. On September 29, 1999, the work for the day was delayed by about 5 hours, and so the operators sought to catch up by mixing multiple batches at the same time. They mixed together 4 2.4 kg batches of solution and then began to pour it into the precipitation tank. The operating limits for this process limited them to 16 kg of 5% or lower enrichment uranium and to 2.4 kg of 16 to 20% enriched uranium. Each one of their batches hit this limit, and they were mixing four batches together all at once. The workers poured the material into the precipitation tank, which was still actually subcritical despite exceeding its operating limits. On the following day, the workers returned and mixed three more batches of solution to add to the tank. They began adding the solution to the precipitation tank, which reached a total of 16.6 kilograms of uranium, which violated their operating limits even for 5% enriched uranium. This mixture also contained 3.12 kilograms of uranium-235 and was about 45 liters in volume. The workers saw a blue flash as they poured in the seventh and final bucket, and then the gamma alarms in this building began to sound. The gamma alarms in the adjacent two buildings also began to sound. 
The workers evacuated, but the solution in the precipitation tank continued to experience prompt supercritical excursions for the following 20 hours. Eventually, several three-man teams entered the facility and ended the supercritical excursions by draining the water cooling jacket that surrounded the precipitation tank. These teams took turns while draining the water so that the workers each received less than 0.1 sieverts of dose. When all was said and done, the accident resulted in about 2.5 times 10 to the 18 fissions. The JCO facility was located in a densely populated area, and because of the radionuclides emitted by the supercritical excursions, all the residents within 350 meters of the facility were evacuated during the accident. Additionally, the entire district was ordered to shelter in place. When all was said and done, about 90% of the residents received less than 5 millisieverts of dose, and no member of the public received more than 25 millisieverts of dose. Produce and milk production in the district was banned following the accident. The two workers who were pouring the solution and who were holding the funnel received between 6 to 10 sieverts and between 16 to 20 sieverts of dose, respectively. A third operator, who was sitting at a desk several meters away, received between 1 and 4.5 sieverts of dose. This operator was hospitalized for three months before eventually recovering from the accident. The two other operators, Hisashi Aochi and Masato Shinohara, were hospitalized and received heroic medical treatment, including several experimental, cutting-edge procedures, but nonetheless they passed away 210 days and 82 days, respectively, following the accident. At the wishes of his family, Auchi was actually revived several times after entering cardiac arrest, even though it was clear that Auchi's condition was not survivable, and even after Auchi declared his wishes not to be revived. Following the accident, JCO lost their operating license for the facility, and the chief executives received some fines and some jail time. JCO also met with several lawsuits, and eventually the company filed for bankruptcy. The factors that led to this accident include a weak understanding of criticality safety by employees at all levels, company pressures to operate more efficiently, and the mindset within JCO that an accident was not credible. I've discussed this accident today because it illustrates the kinetics behind a repeated supercritical transient, but this accident also does a good job of illustrating Magic Merv, more specifically, how to violate almost every aspect of Magic Merv. This accident violated limits or saw effects from mass control, geometry control, interaction control, and almost every other control. The accident also required some absorption control, which involved adding some boric acid to the solution to ensure that it was shut down for good. This accident was extreme in almost every aspect. It caused a significant disruption to an entire district of people, it caused its parent company to go bankrupt, and it resulted in a very painful death for the two operators involved. It was also the most recent criticality accident, which shows that we can never become complacent and ignore the threat of criticality accidents. This concludes our lecture on nuclear reactor kinetics. In the next lecture, we will discuss criticality accident alarm systems.